All right, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to CSIS. This is great. We actually have an audience. Uh, what, two plus years, we've all only seen each other from the top thirds. I'm really happy to get back to warm bodies and handshakes and all of that here at CSIS. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Greg Poling. I direct the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS as well as our Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. And this is, in case you were lost, our U.S. Indo-Pacific Conference, which we're co-hosting with the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. And I couldn't be happier that one, USABC brought this opportunity to us at I think a really opportune moment. Uh, and two, that this is the first big uh, hybrid event that the Southeast Asia program here has been able to host. Really one of the first and probably the biggest in-person events that CSIS has hosted post-COVID. So we're all a bit of guinea pigs here. If you have any comments or complaints, let my colleagues know um, and they'll, they'll take care of it. Uh, everything you hear today is going to be on the record. We'll have it up on CSIS.org. It'll also be broadcast over YouTube, and then the videos and the transcripts will be available for anybody to watch online. We're going to have a modest audience here in the room throughout the two days, and then we'll have a much bigger crowd watching online. Uh, for those online, you'll also be able to ask questions of the panelists and, and the uh, keynotes when available. You can do that by typing in the questions online. Um, the event today, in addition to USABC support, is made possible by a number of, of corporate sponsors, including 3M, Abbott, Amazon, Energy Capital Vietnam, Ford, Freeport McMorrin, GM, Google, Marriott, Pfizer, Samtech, and Visa. And I think that list and the fact that we have both CSIS and USABC here shows you how important the Indo-Pacific is in this town and to the United States, and particularly how important our economic and commercial engagement in the region is. Uh, it is not just about politics and security. It cannot be. Now, this uh, event was, of course, primed to occur just a week after the mooted U.S. ASEAN Special Summit. Uh, we now hope that that will happen sometime in the next month or two. In the meantime, uh, I would encourage you, any ideas, any thoughts, any questions you had for that summit, go ahead and throw it to one of our panelists over the next two days. We're going to have a number of fireside chats with uh, Indo-Pacific Coordinator Kirk Campbell, with Senator John Cornyn, with Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, as well as four great panels on post-pandemic recovery, the digital economy, infrastructure and decarbonization, and the place of ASEAN and the Quad in a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great discussion across all of them. Now, with that, uh, let me cede my time. I want to call up my co-conspirator in organizing this conference. Uh, USABC president and former ambassador to Vietnam, Ted Osius. Ted? Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be Greg's co-conspirator. I love it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for who's joining us in person. Really happy, really happy to see people uh, in person. And thanks to those of you who are joining us online. Um, I'm Ted Osius. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. And just brief background, the council was formed in 1984 to help U.S. businesses grow in Southeast Asia and to promote opportunities for ASEAN in the United States. We are the only American organization uh, recognized in the ASEAN Charter, and we serve, serve as a bridge between the United States and the world's most dynamic region. We have nine offices, including seven in Asia, and today we represent uh, 180 of the world's most dynamic companies, um, those companies that have ties to the region. Our members generate about $7 trillion in revenue and employ more than uh, 14 and a half million people. The Indo-Pacific, I don't have to tell this group, but the Indo-Pacific is the most consequential region for America's future, home to half of of the world's humanity, seven of the world's largest militaries, nine of the world's 10 busiest seaports. The Indo-Pacific powers, powers the global economy and outperforms the rest of the world's markets by several metrics. So over the next few days, next two days, we're going to examine the various facets of the U.S. relationship with the Indo-Pacific. And this includes uh, as Greg mentioned, our shared challenges around security, around public health, as, where, as well as opportunities in the region's energy transition and the digital economy. And we have a stellar lineup of U.S. and ASEAN government officials, corporate leaders, and prominent uh, academics. And 
in advance, I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers for their contributions. Um, Greg listed the, the uh, companies that have supported, su supported this effort. I'm just, for those of you online, make sure you see those logos as well as hear their names. We're deeply grateful for that support. I think it's clear that U.S. industry on the whole recognizes just how much the Indo-Pacific matters to America and America matters to the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, CSIS has been a great partner through this whole uh, process and I hope we're call, gonna be able to call this the first annual uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Conference and continue these conversations over the years. Now, I'm really excited to introduce a very good friend, someone I admire a lot, uh, uh, Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Uh, Derek, from 2012 to 2016, served as U.S. Ambassador to Myanmar. He was, the, he was the United States' first ambassador to that country in 22 years. And prior to that, he served at uh, DOD as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, he was here as a senior fellow for Asia. Uh, we're both uh, alumni of this uh, great organization. Uh, he was uh, from 1997 to 2001, Special Assistant for Asian and Pacific Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And today, he serves as the president of the National Democratic Institute, and we're really happy to say as patron of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council Institute Myanmar Scholarship Fund. So please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Well, good morning, everybody, or wherever you are. Good afternoon, good evening online. Um, thank you, Ted. As Ted said, we, we go back a little bit. He was ambassador in Vietnam when I was ambassador in Myanmar. Um, and a, a congratulations to the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for getting him as your president. Thank you as well to uh, Greg Poling. Congratulations to everyone uh, organizing this event. It is great to be back at CSIS, by the way. This is home. Uh, it's great to be back in person and talking Asia. And in particular, it, I am pleased to open this and talk about something, a country and a cause that is so close to my heart, which is Myanmar. The headlines these days have been all about Ukraine, of course. But it shouldn't be too difficult to see the connection between what is happening in Ukraine and what is going on in Myanmar. I consider Myanmar a kind of domestic version of Ukraine, featuring an invading force trying to steal away the demands of an entire population who is seeking democracy and sovereignty. The people of both countries are not only unwilling to cede what they gained in recent years, but are unwilling to sacrifice virtually everything, but are willing to sacrifice virtually everything to defend their rights and dignity against those who would brutally and brazenly take it away. In Ukraine, of course, we all understand the future of European security is at stake. But Ukraine also represents a pattern that should deeply concern even those outside Europe. The forces that believe might makes right are on the march in country after country around the world, from inside and outside nations, assaulting democracy and national sovereignty with impunity and supporting one another in the process, as Russia, and it seems in recent days China, is doing in support of Myanmar's illegitimate regime. And Myanmar, in return, is returning that favor. These autocratic forces believe the democratic world will respond tentatively, weakly, and partially, adhering to a deluded form of realpolitik that says the will of a nation's people doesn't matter in international affairs, as if our values and norms can be divorced from our own individual and collective security. Political leaders everywhere are watching closely and will adjust according to which way the wind is blowing. It is sometimes difficult to comprehend just how utterly bankrupt, morally bankrupt and corrupt, Myanmar's military called the Tatmadaw is. And has been really for years. Its fundamental mission, to remind everyone, its pacing challenge, as we say these days, is killing its own people. They have demonstrated little hesitation to destroy the country's hopeful future in order to protect its power and privilege. And a central element of that destruction of Myanmar's hopeful future has been its attacks, direct and indirect, over many generations on Myanmar's young people. When I served as ambassador, I saw that promise firsthand. 
Myanmar's young people knew the stories of the country's dark past, but clearly saw a different future for themselves than what their parents and their grandparents had experienced. I watched during the years of Myanmar's nascent opening as they seized every opportunity presented to them. They worked hard, thought big, built businesses, became tech-savvy entrepreneurs, and eagerly connected to the outside world. And in the process, they proved themselves to be endlessly creative, energetic, smart, optimistic, and resourceful. Last year's military coup set that all back. It has devastated the country's educational system, and at the same time made it significantly more difficult for Myanmar students abroad, including in the United States, to receive the necessary financial support. As a result, many of these international students, the best and brightest of their country, face the possibility of having to abandon their studies and return home to an uncertain future at best. Anyone who cares about the future of the Indo-Pacific must care about Myanmar's future, situated as it is at the crossroads of South and East Asia. And anyone who cares about Myanmar's future must invest in its young people. That's why I was so keen to serve as a patron of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council Initiative's new initiative, uh, Institute's new initiative, to financially support Myanmar students currently studying here in the United States. The U.S. ABCI Myanmar Scholarship Fund seeks to raise $2 million per year in each of the next three years for a supplementary scholarship program to support U.S.-based Myanmar students whose education has been disrupted by the political situation in Myanmar and are now facing financial difficulties in completing their degree programs. The program aims to provide grants of $5,000 per academic year to 340 of these Myanmar undergraduate and graduate students. To administer and manage the issuance of the scholarships, the USABCI has established a partnership with the Institute of International Education, IIE. So far, the USABCI has raised more than $800,000 from U.S. companies and private individuals, and some of them are in this room and want to thank them. <clears throat> that includes an initial endowment from Chevron and contributions from Meta, the Asia Group, Bauer Group Asia, McClarty Associates, and other friends of Myanmar. But we are seeking more sponsors for the program, and I urge everyone here in this room, everyone listening, um, with the means to do so to strongly consider supporting this initiative as a way for members and friends of the U.S. business community to invest meaningfully in Myanmar's future. IIE's extensive screening and vetting system will help ensure that all donations go towards purely educational purposes and do not involve any politically contentious entities or affiliates. The funds that are donated will never leave the United States. So let me take the opportunity again to applaud Ted, Ambassador Osius, for, for this initiative, and if I may say Jack Mint, who's probably somewhere in this room or in the back here, for his commitment and energy and personal passion. There he is. There he is. There. Congratulations, Jack. This was really all Jack and with his passion and energy to bring this personal vision to reality. Finally, let me say I, I stand here this morning in the place of someone who left us recently but who also had long interest in Myanmar and was as inspiring and important an American public servant as any in my lifetime. And that was Madeleine Albright. Uh, Madeleine had agreed to serve as co-chair of this initiative. Over the past decade, she and I had countless conversations about the situation in Myanmar. She was chair of the NDI board, uh, which I am president. She had a keen interest that began when she was UN ambassador and continued as U.S. Secretary of State to the present. She, like the rest of us, was heartbroken over the destruction of the country over the past year. As many of you know, Madeline taught for decades at Georgetown. She loved it because she found hope and inspiration in the promise of younger generations to find new and better ways to advance human society. In that vein, she loved to quote Robert Frost, who said something along the lines of, the older I get, the younger are my teachers. Uh, Myanmar can use some young teachers, a new generation with fresh perspectives to break the cycle of chauvinism, underdevelopment, repression, and violence that have held back a beautiful country with such vast potential. As a young woman fighting the Tatmadaw in the Myanmar jungles told the New York Times last week, 
Our generation has ideals. We believe in freedom. I know Madeline would have been inspired by those words and would have loved to be able to support them herself. I hope the rest of us may do so in her absence to invest now in that different, more hopeful future for Myanmar. Thank you very much. And I believe Ted is supposed to come up and introduce Kurt. And I don't know if they're back there or they're waiting for Kurt or whether I need a tap dance in order <laughs> to, to, so uh, do I just, uh, I'll leave the stage and let somebody else come up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amber, uh, Ambassador Mitchell, very much. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute coffee break uh, in preparation for our next fireside chat. So you are welcome to hang on your seats. You are welcome to enjoy the coffee and beverages. Those online, just hang with us. We'll be right back. Thank you.
Yes, that would be best. Yep. Yep. that I have my purse here, but. Okay, yeah, let me make sure my phone's off because that would be embarrassing. You're gonna have me speak first? Okay, do you mind? No, not at okay. all. Yep, Jennifer, yep. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, good to see you. Thanks. Sure. Hi, I'm Jennifer Young. Melissa, nice to meet you. We're color yes. coordinated. Yes. I, I realize yes. I have really yes. colored yes. socks on, though. But <laughs> Good to I see. guess it's too late for that. Hi, everyone. Too late. Too late for that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Morrison. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS, where I run our Global Health Policy Center. And I'm delighted to be here today with this remarkable panel. And a special thanks to Greg Poling and Ted Oshius for pulling this whole whole program together. Those of us, uh, those of you who are joining online. You can submit questions, and please do, and we'll curate those and, and bring those uh, forward in the course of the discussion. We don't have that much time, right? We're going to go to about 40 after the hour. So uh, we're gonna hear from our, our speakers in, in quick succession. This is a panel on the new normal. It's one that's looking at the questions of how do you reopen Southeast Asia, how do you reopen safely and be, continue to be prepared for the uncertain possibilities that lie ahead in terms of the pandemic? How do you reopen? What is this going to mean in economic terms and with respect to air traffic and tourism and return to growth in this period? So we have deliberately put together a very impressive panel. I'll quickly introduce uh, the speakers in the order that we'll hear from them. Melissa Brown's with us. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Southeast Asia at the Department of State. Uh, we're joined by, uh, from, the, uh, 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 from the Indonesian Embassy, the Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, Ida Bagus Made Bimantara, otherwise known as Sade. Sade, welcome, thank you for being with us. Jennifer Young, uh, Senior Director and Lead on Policy and Public Affairs at and Emerging Asia and Pfizer, thank you so much, Jennifer. And Faith Colvin, uh, Vice President, Global Public Policy and International Affairs at the Marriott International. So we have a terrific and very diverse group here today uh, with us. Um, just a few quick remarks. Um, you know, this is an upbeat panel. This is a positive panel. This is one that's optimistic while being cautious. And, uh, and it kind of contrasts so sharply with what we're reading in the papers around Hong Kong, the tragedies there, the struggles within China, DPRK in terms of zero COVID. Um, this is really a, 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 a case where the pandemic response has been uh, 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 in many cases quite successful and others fallen short, but nonetheless, it, we're reaching a point where the changing nature of the pandemic, the arrival of antivirals, success on getting uh, vaccination levels up um, and, and uh, has, is leading to this search for what is the new normal? What do we def how do we define it? What does it mean? And of course it does mean continuing to think about um, the, 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 the continued threats. We know we have, as we are struggling with here, we have questions of the, the new variant, VA2, we have the waning immunity, uh, of those elderly and immunocompromised populations that remain very vulnerable. Um, and so it's a complicated moment. It's the debate that's going on is not that different fundamentally from the debate we're having here in our own country, where, as you know, we're struggling to make sure we have the adequate budgets and policies in place to reopen safely. So with that, let me turn over to Melissa to kick things off, uh, followed by Sade, Jennifer, and Faith. Over to you, Melissa. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, it's funny in terms of the search for the new normal because I just came back from a, from a trip. I went to the Philippines, Vietnam, and Japan last week. I got back late Saturday night, so I feel like I am a living experiment of what traveling in the new normal is, and it, it gave me a little bit of a sense of, of whiplash because each country approaches things so differently, whether it be um, how people conduct themselves in meetings or just passing through the airport and immigration. So certainly moving on to that next phase, but it was, it was honestly a, a bright reminder that COVID is not over and that it's much, very much uh, a new normal. A, a big thank you to USABC and CSIS for, for having me here today. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a great joy to be here in person. I think we all, we all feel, uh, feel the energy to see, see folks in person versus on the screen, although a, a big hello to those who are joining us online. Um, just two years ago, the Indo-Pacific was absolutely in a very different situation. I think one thing that we've all been taught is that there is no such thing as a, as a local health crisis. In fact, um, this ongoing regional and global health crisis and challenge, it, it demands cooperative regional and global solutions. So I thought I would talk a little bit about how the State Department, the Biden administration, and the whole of the U.S. government is committed to addressing these challenges across the Indo-Pacific. So first, when we're talking about the global action plan, um, we've We've learned over the past two years what we definitely need to do is get control over COVID-19 spread, whether it be the, the new variants or, or what got this all started. The desire to prioritize saving lives and protecting those at the highest risk with targeted vaccinations, with tests, with treatments. But we also need to address um, something that's quite dear, I think, to many in the audience is, is the last mile issues. It's the supply chains, it's the information gaps, it's the spread of false information in order to get those shots in arms and improve access to testing and treatment. Um, we also are gonna have to build for the future by committing to build, sustain, and finance the global capacity that we now know is necessary for an emerging COVID-19, the new variants, and for future health crisis, whatever they might be. So Secretary Blinken, he's, he's noted before, this is not just a health crisis. This is also a humanitarian, a development, and a security crisis. And, and to quote him, health security is now national security. So just in, in February, uh, Secretary Blinken joined together with 18 other nations and organizations, and they launched the COVID-19 Global Action Plan. And the goal there was to intensify international coordination to end the acute phase of the pandemic in 2022, and then also to uh, address the challenges that are hindering progress towards meeting the global target of the 70% vaccination in all countries. Uh, this, this action plan builds on President Biden's earlier global COVID-19 summit, and it's the themes of vaccinating the world, saving lives now, and building better health security. So the, the call to countries is to step up and support six lines of effort. Number one, get shots in arms. The idea is to coordinate efforts to improve vaccine readiness and logistics, to increase donations and procurement, and again, that goal of 70% of the population being fully vaccinated. The, the second one is to bolster supply chain resilience, to ensure sufficient and steady supplies of critical products and material, something we saw was a real a f flaw early on in the pandemic. Uh, third, to address the information gaps, uh, and that's aiming to enhance vaccine confidence um, and also combat the spread of, of false information across the board. Number four, support healthcare workers um, and also increasing the, the, the training and the numbers of, of healthcare workers. Number five, ensure acute non-vaccine interventions. That's to better collaborate to provide other treatments, therapeutics, testing regimes, and oxygen. And then finally, number six, strengthen the global security architecture. That's looking ahead to how we can join together to um, deal with future emergencies. One thing the U.S. government is, is, is really proud of is 
the efforts to help catalyze more vaccine donations. Um, the U.S. continues to, to lead the way. I think sometimes that's not well known in the, in the region, but the United States has donated over 503 million doses to more than 110 countries and economies. Looking at uh, the East Asia and Pacific region, where, where I focus, we've donated more than 117 million vaccine doses to 14 countries and entities. The number keeps, um, keeps increasing. Frankly, sometimes we have more doses than countries are able to, to receive. Um, very proud of those efforts, and the goal there is to save lives in, in the short time. So let me just briefly uh, give two further examples. The Philippines, we've donated more than 33 million doses there. But in addition to those doses, we've addressed the cold chain support side of the system. And that was focused on pediatric vaccine storage and movement. Our medical unit at the U.S. Embassy provided training on how to administer vaccines to children. And they did some interesting things like holding a vaccination clinic at the zoo um, with characters and balloons and candy-filled backpacks to try to convince kids that this was something that they, they uh, were going to feel comfortable in seeking out. In the, in the meantime, USAID in the Philippines is, is also working to support the planning and registration of future uh, clinics and also campaigning to address some of the school issues. We realize school is not quite fully open in the Philippines, so that's something we're working together shoulder to shoulder to, to try to achieve. And then um, DCM Sade will appreciate this. In, in Indonesia, we've worked really hard to train 6,300 health workers to, to work together. Uh, there's a, quite a number of mobile and temporary vaccine sites that we've had to st stand up. And together, we've been able to administer a number of doses. But from the United States, there's been more than 35 million contributed to Indonesia. Um, but stepping back, what we want to do is we want to help people get vaccinated and save lives now in the short term. When we look to travel, we are working on advancing um, international travel and ensuring that people have the, the health and safety protocols in place to, to do so. Um, turning to, to APEC, uh, there's the APEC Safe Passage Task Force, which is chaired by Thailand. Um, as, as the 2022 host. And this was established to coordinate resuming cross-border travel. So just last year, the United States uh, joined with a number of other APEC e economies to adhere to these international best practices so that air crews, for example, um, could continue to serve so that supply chains and essential workers could continue to move across the region. The good news is the United States is hosting APEC in 2023, and this is one of these areas where we want to continue to move forward Thailand's priorities. And then those of you who know me well know I have to talk about ASEAN. Um, you know, specifically the United States has, has partnered with, with ASEAN to launch the U.S. ASEAN Health Futures Initiative. And the idea there is to look at where the U.S. has a strategic advantage. Um, and we've committed to provide up to $40 million in new efforts for joint research to strengthen health system capacity and to develop the, the next generation of, of health capital uh, in leaders. This contributes to, when you do some complicated math, more than $3.5 billion that the United States has spent over the last 20 years across uh, ASEAN on these health initiatives. Um, but that's something we'll, we'll hopefully be able to celebrate soon within ASEAN health ministers um, meeting coming up. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to mention, you know, back in February, you all saw um, Secretary, uh, Secretary Blinken was able to fully uh, launch the Indo-Pacific strategy that the president had initiated. And it, it, it very clearly outlined our vision of where 
the region is headed. And it emphasized that we're aiming for a free and open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient region. And I think for this conversation today, it's that resiliency that's something that we, we really need to stress um, whenever there are transnational challenges, whether they be health, whether they be climate change, they've, they've hindered our economic development and they've demonstrated the need for friends, partners, allies to join together to address these challenges. So as the United States aims to, to build back better, we aim to work with, with, again, those friends, those partners, and those allies to address the current challenges and those that might come up next. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. Uh, Sade, DCM, Embassy of Indonesia. You're going to speak to us both about ASEAN and Indonesia. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Uh, and, and this is a great opportunity, I think, for me to uh, be an, in an in-person meeting, uh, finally, after a couple of years of only uh, looking through the Zoom. And uh, uh, this, I think this is my first uh, time uh, sitting with a live audience, yeah, so uh, congratulations for USABC and also uh, CSIS for organizing this. And uh, I have five minutes, right, to go through my, go my talking points. Uh, so uh, they asked us to uh, speak about efforts of, for post-pandemic uh, uh, recovery for Indonesia and also ASEAN. Uh, and uh, just to give a little bit of context that this pandemic for the last two years has uh, devastated the economy of, of Indonesia. Uh, in the past decade, we have grown about five to six percent, but uh, in 2020 and also 2021, we contracted our economy of, of more than uh, seven percent. So, for example, uh, our per capita GDP in the last uh, 10 years or so uh, grew from 19 percent of OECD average uh, to 29 percent of OECD um, average. And our ASEAN GDP uh, grew from 17% of, of ASEAN to, to now about 35% um, contribution. And in 2019, we grew about 5%, but uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, contracted about uh, seven uh, something percent. So this, this fall uh, added an addi additional of uh, 10 million people into uh, poverty in Indonesia. And the second thing is that the pandemic exposed a number of uh, weaknesses in our uh, health system, much like uh, in ASEAN countries and, and all around the world, I'm, I'm sure, in R&D, in manufacturing, in supply chain, and in medicine and medical devices, and particularly in vaccine uh, production. Uh, the third point is that the pandemic devastated our uh, tourism sector. Uh, Bali and the Riau uh, province, uh, Riau Island province, uh, contracted uh, double-digit uh, 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 number, and this was uh, the deepest uh, contraction for uh, any provinces in Indonesia because of their economic structure that relied uh, on um, on tourism. Now we didn't we didn't let the crisis uh, go to waste, yeah, uh, in Indonesia. So we learned uh, the hard way, and uh, we took concrete steps to for economic recovery, to strengthen our health system, and to re recover our tourism sector, and also uh, in parallel to contribute to ASEAN's um, efforts. Uh, now on the economic recovery, for example, we, in the uh, uh, past two years, we uh, rolled out about 100 billion US dollar in um, a number of uh, uh, programs and initiatives in health, social protections, uh, priority programs for SMEs and also uh, labor intensive uh, initiatives in Indonesia. And on top of that, in 2020, the Indonesian government rolled out uh, an aggressive uh, and deep set of economic reforms, which we call the omnibus law, which consolidated 79 uh, separate laws on economic uh, matters uh, into just one uh, law. Now, this story has not been told and, and heard, uh, I think, around the world uh, enough. Uh, if, you, if, uh, if we uh, look at the death and of the uh, um, expand of this, of this law, uh, so to improve Indonesia's investment and business climate, 
uh, and um, this law, among others, uh, simplify uh, land procurement processes, uh, business licensing processes, reformation of la labor regulations and tax regulations, and also uh, to enhance the attractiveness of a number of special economic zones in Indonesia. And the second thing that we did was to strengthen our, our health system, uh, including in uh, increasing our domestic capacity in R&D, in manufacturing, uh, supply chain for medicine and medical devices, PPE and vaccine production, and we are, of course, uh, collaborating with the U.S. and also with uh, the private sectors around uh, the U.S. and around the world as well to, uh, to achieve that. And uh, we collaborate internationally to build a more robust international health uh, architecture and all. Also, we participated in the global uh, summit, uh, global COVID summit that the U.S. initiated. And uh, recently also the WHO has designated Indonesia as uh, one of the only two hub uh, to manufacture mRNA uh, vaccines around the world. So we want to do our part to contribute uh, to the region in uh, manufacturing mRNA vaccines. Uh, for example, our companies can manufacture about 3 billion uh, vaccines per year, uh, 14 different types of vaccines, and we hope to be able to uh, uh, manufacture more vaccines uh, in the years to come. And uh, the third uh, steps that we took is to recover our tourism sector. During the pandemic, for example, uh, we gave direct financial assistance to those uh, businesses and SMEs in distress. And I know, uh, I know, uh, uh, that many, for example, in Bali and uh, Riau provinces, they uh, had to sell their uh, their assets. They had to go back to their kampung, uh, and they have to sell their land and, and, and motorcycles even. And it was really devastating for them. So uh, we rolled out a number of programs and uh, to increase the capacity and, and prepare uh, for the tourism in the new normal and preparing the strategies to reopen uh, border and, and tourism. And we are happy now to, uh, to have our borders uh, open and uh, visa on arrival for Americans as well and for other 42 uh, countries. So welcome to visit uh, Bali and Indonesia anytime now. Uh, and perhaps uh, the next conference can be in Bali, Stephen. Yeah. And, uh, and the fourth uh, step that we took is uh, to contribute regionally uh, with the ASEAN efforts. We, uh, we led the way for a collective response to 2019 coronavirus uh, disease outbreak, and we set up the mechanism for it. The ASEAN uh, Strategic Framework for Public Health Emergencies, for example, and also we set up a COVID-19 uh, response fund together with the ASEAN countries and all of our partners, including uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, as well. So just uh, think my five minutes is up just to re recap. Uh, the crisis gave us this opportunity to transform. Um, ourselves, uh, and we took concrete steps to uh, improve uh, Indonesia's investment and business climate for economic recovery and to build uh, the resiliency and the capacity of our health system, uh, which we did, but it is a work in progress, and, and third, to strengthen our uh, tourism sector, and lastly, to contribute to ASEAN's efforts uh, for a collective response, uh, build a mechanism for uh, a stronger global health uh, architecture, and establish a COVID uh, response uh, fund. Stephen, back to you. Thank you very much. That was terrific, Sade. Next speaker is Jennifer Young from Pfizer. Of course, Pfizer is terribly important on both mRNA and antivirals today. It's great to have you with us, Jennifer. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen. And just thank, a big thank you to the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and to CSIS for the invitation. Um, when I think about the new normal, I think about the way in which the pandemic has triggered us to rethink the way that healthcare systems operate, not only in terms of how companies like Pfizer partner to innovate and deliver breakthroughs that change patients' lives, but also how we can reach patients more effectively and efficiently, harnessing the power of science. So today I would like to highlight two things. Uh, first is the importance of public-private partnership in spurring investment in innovation, particularly as healthcare and digital ecosystems are converging in the post-COVID landscape. And secondly, how digital health, is shape, digital health is shaping the future in ASEAN. So COVID-19 has shown a spotlight like no other on the importance of public-private partnerships, in particular to manage the most significant public health crisis that any of us have faced in our lifetimes. The global community and ASEAN member states have stepped up and it has become clear that all of us have a role to play. 
For our part, Pfizer remains focused on where and how we can make the greatest impact, finding innovative ways to expand access to our science. Our purpose at Pfizer is breakthroughs that change patients' lives, and I can't think of a more important breakthrough that has had the opportunity to change lives than the COVID-19 vaccine in recent times. From day one of our vaccine development program, we've been working with global governments, including the U.S. government, and international health leaders to ensure fair and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. Through supply agreements with governments and partnerships with international collaborators, for example, COVAX, the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine has been able to reach more than 178 countries to date. And that includes all of ASEAN member states, and that reach only continues to expand. This also includes the 2 billion doses that we have pledged to low- and middle-income economies through the end of this year to help bring an end to the pandemic. Over this difficult time, we have seen the power of public-private collaboration, and as healthcare and digital ecosystems converge in ASEAN, there are increasing opportunities to pursue partnership approaches. Our perspective is that innovation is a combination of invention plus adoption. There's plenty of innovation out there, and I think we've identified that an important role that we can play is to enable and drive adoption through partnerships across the health system. One example of how Pfizer is doing this is through corporate-to-corporate R&D partnerships, and this is where we're able to leverage our respective strengths, for example, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, COVID-19 vaccine development. Overall, public-private partnerships during the pandemic have played a key role in spurring investment and innovation and building a pipeline of more than 750 therapies and vaccines in development quickly. It's been truly amazing uh, from the biopharma industry perspective to see how we've been able to come together and respond so rapidly due to the strong scientific and development infrastructure that's already in place. And this highlights also the need to ensure and nurture innovation ecosystems going forward. It's also worth noting that the pace of adoption is key. And one thing that COVID has taught us is that invention can take place in one part of the world, be produced in another, and ultimately be adopted at a very rapid pace elsewhere. And this can occur if we continue to remove roadblocks to adoption. And the way to do this is to build a system of global reliance so that we can avoid duplication of processes and bring new technology to the world faster. We should also extend this concept beyond COVID for life-saving drugs, for cancer therapies, and for rare disease therapies. At Pfizer, we've been driving the adoption of innovative treatments within healthcare systems and pathways for many, many years. And we can apply this experience to the technology space and use our global, sp global scale to really help smaller companies as well bring their breakthroughs to a much wider audience. We have formed healthcare partnerships between our digital innovation centers, uh, accelerators and incubators, and as mentioned, we have many partnerships across the healthcare ecosystem. But it's important to note as well that an enabling environment for local innovation is also important to drive socioeconomic development. It's important that in addition to partnerships with foreign innovators, governments continue to nurture their own talent and look at setting up structures for them to benefit from their own innovation in country and beyond their own borders. So lastly, I'll turn to how digital help is shaping the future in ASEAN. As a result of the pandemic, the whole healthcare system has been forced to seek new ways of operating, and we've all become much more familiar with how to operate in this new digital ecosystem. This shift presents an opportunity for us to consolidate many of the behaviors that we've learned as a result of COVID to establish new ways to help deliver healthcare more efficiently and effectively to improve patient outcomes and experiences. While we continue to build our digital mindset internally at Pfizer, our ultimate goal is to continue to produce safe and effective uh, therapies for patients. Some of the efforts that we have underway include expanding the coverage of vaccination programs for flu and for pneumococcal disease. We're helping to promote healthy behaviors, for example, smoking cessation. We're also helping to further enable telemedicine by removing regulatory barriers, working in close cooperation with regulators and governments. And we're also trying to enable dispensing of medicines for longer dur durations for chronic treatment. So looking ahead, I think it's clear that telehealth and digital therapeutics will continue to gain significant traction in ASEAN, specifically digital delivery interventions that can augment drug therapies and help support adherence. As well, AI and machine learning, data science in general, um, is a game changer, not only for deep personalization of digital companion applications, 
um, but also for drug discovery and disease detection. So in summary, despite the challenges of COVID, which we've all endured now for far too long, um, I believe the future is bright in ASEAN, and this will be driven by partnership across many healthcare ecosystem players. And at Pfizer, such innovation-driven collaboration helps us to continue to deliver on our purpose, which again is breakthroughs that change patients' lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Faith Colvin, Marriott International. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And I'm sure my company would second Sade's idea of having the second annual Indo Pacific <laughs> Summit in Bali. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve on today's panel. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you to the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and also to CSIS for the opportunity. Um, I certainly share that this is an op op um, optimistic panel. Um, obviously, it's an exciting new stage as we enter this new normal and countries across the region start to reopen their borders for international travel. I'm pleased to be here today representing Marriott International. Our company has a robust presence in the region with 470 properties currently open in the ASEAN countries and 280 additional properties in the pipeline. We're present in seven, soon to be eight of the ASEAN countries and are really excited about the opportunities for growth. Before the pandemic, as many of us are aware, Southeast Asia was the fastest growing region in the world for international tourism. So in 2019, the last full year before the pandemic, there were 139 million international arrivals in the region. Now, unfortunately, last year in 2021, that number dropped to just 3.3 million, which represents 2% of that record total in 2019. So obviously, as uh, Sade and others have shared, for economies that are heavily reliant on tourism, it had significant economic impacts. So um, slowed economic activity, increased unemployment, and increased poverty. I think the good news is that in this new normal period of economic recovery, travel and tourism has the potential to serve as a significant driver of economic growth across the region. Travel is trade and its dividends are significant. For every $1 generated by the travel and tourism industry directly, there are more than $2 generated indirectly. Um, when foreign visitors travel into ASEAN countries, they inject new money into local economies by staying at the hotels, eating at the restaurants, shopping in the stores, and conducting business. These are all travel exports and all of this spending is critical to economic growth and recovery. The good news we've seen is that consumer demand for travel is incredibly resilient, even though we've all been at home, or especially because we've all been at home for the last couple of years. As vaccination rates continue to rise and restrictions ease, we've seen travel rebound quickly, often led first by leisure and domestic travel in many markets, with significant potential for growth as international and business travel continue to return. To capitalize on this renewed and growing demand for new travel experiences from consumers, industry must join governments and policymakers to ensure that the right conditions are in place to welcome travelers as they're ready to travel, in particular across international borders. We see the role of the private sector as continuing to adapt to new consumer preferences, elevating best practices in health and safety, and delivering digital solutions for a more seamless, personalized travel experience. When governments put in place policies to facilitate international travel, we've seen the demand is there, oftentimes almost immediately. For example, after the governments in Mexico and the Maldives reopened their borders for international travel, our company's properties in those countries saw their best years ever on record in 2021, and that's exceeding pre-pandemic levels. In Indonesia just this year, we've seen occupancy rates at our properties soar as the government has reopened international borders and, just as importantly, international flights have increased. Vaccination and mass vaccination in particular plays an incredibly important role, both for COVID-19 mitigation as well as boosting confidence in reopening borders. And the great news is that the vaccination rate in the ASEAN countries, as some other panelists have discussed, is on the rise. In Singapore now, for example, 95% of the eligible population is fully vaccinated, which is a number I know many countries in the world would, would emulate. The rest of the region ranges anywhere from 40 to 70% to fully vaccinated. We see governments in the private sector, including the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and its members, of which Marriott is one, partnering together in the following ways to support travel and tourism in this new normal time period. Number one, boosting confidence in travel. And this is done by developing, developing and implementing clear science-based protocols for screening, testing, hygiene, and quarantine. 
Two, digitizing the process to verify and authenticate health records and making sure that these technical solutions are interoperable, not just between countries, but also, of course, between uh, across institutions within a single country. So making sure the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Tourism, for example, can use and access the same digital documents. And then number three is continuing to harmonize protocols across the ASEAN countries. Uh, a lot of work has already been done in this respect, but continuing that process would go a long way towards the development of a true regional travel corridor. And this is important for two reasons. Number one, we know from experience that a lot of international travelers in the ASEAN region tend to visit multiple countries and multiple destinations within a country, so it helped facilitate those, those visits. But then also to facilitate travel within the region by ASEAN citizens themselves. And this is important in part due to the changing composition of visitors to the reason, region as a result of COVID. So before the pandemic, we know that China was the number one source market for international tourists in the region, and we don't see Chinese travelers returning in large numbers in the near to medium term, in large part because of the two-week quarantine requirement upon return to China. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia all continue to have relatively restrictive travel restrictions in place. So it'll be more and more important for ASEAN citizens to be able to travel freely within their own region. In conclusion, we've seen how um, countries and regions now compete for international uh, tourists and travel and business just like companies do. And the ones that we think will win in this new normal time period will be those that put in place effective policies streamlining cross-border travel, leading to greater economic growth and recovery. Thank you so much. Look forward to the questions. Thank you. Um, I want to pose um, a broad question for all of you to answer, but I also want to direct some specific questions to each of you. The broad question is that the pandemic has gone through major changes. We've got new tools with the arrival of antivirals. People are feeling more optimistic. But there's also two other things happening as a result of that. One is the risk that we're in a cycle of crisis followed by complacency. I mean, we've seen here in the, here in here in the United States, the, the supplemental, the international aid falls out. And there was a previous debacle on the omnibus bill. Um, what does that signal? Does that signal exhaustion, that people are moving beyond, that the level of interest? We know on health security, pandemic response, crises, that there's a pattern. It's very difficult to sustain the, the political will and the dynamism uh, of this uh, response. And we're seeing that manifest in very dramatic ways, and it's raising lots of questions around you know, the global vax program at USAID is run out of money, for instance. I mean, there's some real hardships created by this. The other thing that's happening that's more positive is that there's a real rethink going on uh, across the world around what's the strategy. People are questioning 70% vaccination goal. Does that make sense? Should we shift to a vaccination level that the countries themselves set individually that focuses on the most vulnerable? Do we need to elevate the emphasis on test and treat, the manufacturing hubs? Um, all of those things are now very important along with putting a focus on vaccine disinformation, misinformation, hesitancy, refusal, a dimension that is profound in so many places, underestimated. So the question I want each of you to try and touch on is how is your thinking taking account of this risk that we're, people are going to walk away from their commitments, that we're going to, that the exhaustion, the longevity of this pandemic is leading people to want to exit engagement. How are you going to work against that? And the new strategies that were emerging. I'm sure, Sadi, you can tell us a bit about how Indonesia itself. On the specific questions, I want to ask Melissa to tell us a bit about this, update the status on the quad and the quad commitments, and if you could speak to that, you know, the billion dose, and now we have excess capacity of, uh, excess supply of vaccines. How, what's, if you can tell us a bit about, about that. On um, Sade and, and Jennifer, it would be good to, for each of you to tell us a bit about what can we expect in terms of creation of manufacturing capacity in these hubs in the next two, three years. What are we expecting to see in terms of the new partnerships? Because there's enormous excitement and enormous interest, and, um, and both of you are actively engaged uh, in, 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 that, uh, in, that, in that respect. And Faith, I, I wanted you to tell us a bit about the way in which 
the hotel industry has changed in this period because obviously there's, there's heightened focus on ventilation and improving ventilation. There's heightened focus on all sorts of other practices that, that, that will lure th those customers back feeling more confident about the environment that they're entering. If you could say a few words about that. So let me, let me ask Melissa to, uh, to kick things off uh, with a, a response to the, the broad question, but then this, uh, give us a bit of an update on the quad. Thanks. I think in terms of the, the, the broad question, um, I, I noted briefly earlier, but it, frankly, it, from traveling around uh, over the last couple of weeks, I'll say the United States seems like the country where we're, we're tending towards moving on and kind of forgetting that there was a pandemic. While it feels um, absolutely in Southeast Asia as well as in Japan that, that the eye is very much still on, on the ball. Um, so just that's, you know, my personal personal observation. I think specifically with ASEAN, one of the reasons we're investing in things like the U.S. ASEAN Health Futures Initiative is to create these institutions and frameworks so that we, we don't kind of move on from the pandemic and put it behind us and move on to the next hot new crisis. Instead, it's, it's that, that longer term investment in, in training of people and identifying longer term resources and creating those sort of partnerships. One of the things that this administration we've, we've made very clear is also we would like to, to reinvest in, in multilateralism and uh, in, in, in again, as I mentioned earlier, joining with those friends, with those partners, with those allies to see what could be done. So it's, the Quad is a, a great example. Um, you know, the, the design of the Quad is not to substitute for other mechanisms. You know, for instance, the, all Quad members have, have a, a very important key relationship with ASEAN, and by creating the Quad, that is not meant to put those relationships aside. Instead, um, it, it's, it's designed to, to complement that. And so the idea is to look as well at where um, initiatives and visions for the future, where there's a lot of convergence. That's, that's a, a very popular word these days in, in, in DC. But the thinking there is we, we often have more in common with others than we have in terms of difference. So what we're trying to achieve with, with the Quad, um, it plays off what we as individual countries are doing when it comes to, to vaccines and to the donations, whether they be through COVAX or um, done, done so bilaterally, whether it be done with public-private partnerships. So the, the Quad thinking um, is, is in addition to uh, donating vaccines, it's creating um, the new mechanism, I think, in particular with the role of India and their uh, ability to play to their strength. And so that's, that's the thinking when it comes to what we can achieve. Um, we recently had our ministerial in Australia. Hopefully, um, in, the, in the coming months, we'll be able to have a, a quad summit at the leaders level and continue to move that forward. Uh, but that's something that, that all four countries are working in, working on day in and day out to, to make that, those billion do doses a reality. Melissa, there's one question from the audience around COVAX. Yeah. And the question, I it's think, is really about, question. okay, the, the donations of the, of, of the Pfizer mRNA goes through COVAX. Uh, how is the delivery achieved and, and, and is the identity of the donor known in the course of that? Are we, are, we, are we getting sufficient credit for the diplomacy and the vaccine diplomacy? Yeah, it's, a, it's really an excellent question. I think um, it, this one was tricky because, uh, as many of you know, in the last administration, we were not um, participating in COVAX, and that was a very early d decision by President Biden to make sure that we were present and really investing a lot. Um, I think the public diplomacy and putting those American flags on the on the deliveries was a little bit um, late in coming, but it was something we did we did recognize. Um, throughout, we're very clear that the United States provides vaccine donations with no strings attached. That's that's um, absolutely non-negotiable. Um, and trust me, 
There have been times where we wanted to give them uh, for, for, you know, you're thinking, oh, there's a great strategic reason, and quickly we're told, no, that's, that's not the goal of this. So it very much is absolutely no strings attached, but that doesn't mean without credit. So I think um, we've done a better job over the, the last six, nine months to make sure that um, that tie to the United States is made, and that's often through public diplomacy. Um, this question also addresses, are the populations aware that they're coming from the United States? I'll tell you where it's most clear. It's where, um, it's Vietnam. And that's where, um, within the government, we joke sometimes about, you don't want to have the actual outcome being a visit. You know, some really important person went to the country. Oh, look at that outcome. On the other hand, when vice, the vice president made her trip out to the region, I can tell you in, in particular with Vietnam, one of the reasons that that, that uh, linkage to the United States, to Pfizer, was made was because of the star power that the vice president does, does have. So I, I, again, that's a great question because I think it's something we didn't do well at the beginning and I think we're doing better now that we can support COVAX but also take credit for what the United States is doing. Thank you. Sade, uh, in Indonesia, are you struggling with this change of the, the change of the pandemic, the changed perceptions, the fatigue factor, people arguing they want to move on? Are you seeing that? And and how, what can we expect on the manufacturing hub in the next couple of years? Uh, yes, Stephen, at some level we are seeing that. But before I, I go and answer that question, I'm just wanting to add to what Melissa uh, said about the COVAX and the uh, U.S. donation that, that John, Josh, uh, Brandon asked from the Asia Foundation. Uh, before coming here, uh, I was at the team also to handle the uh, vaccine donations from throughout the world, and we are uh, grateful to receive 28 uh, million vaccines from uh, the U.S. And uh, I and my team, we personally go to uh, the airport and pick those vaccines up, and we make sure that uh, we give credits to uh, the U.S. and also to COVAX up as well. And uh, we have uh, put the, uh, those shots in about 200 million Indonesian arms uh, already. Uh, both vaccines that we procured ourselves and the vaccines that have been uh, donated. So uh, back to your question, Stephen, about the uh, uh, cycle of the crisis and then followed by compl uh, complacency and, and also um, Indonesians being really tired about uh, uh, wearing uh, masks and having their nose uh, poked <laughs> in and PCR and everything. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, that as well. Uh, but I think the government is um, succeeding in um, ensuring uh, that uh, shots uh, get in arms, and we are up to about 76 something percent, um, and and soon we will reach our target of 200 vaccine, uh, 208 million um, vaccines, and uh, we are uh, not rethinking on the strategy. I think 70 to 75 percent is is a good number, and we uh, of course. Uh, refer to the WHO for, for uh, their strategy uh, as well. And uh, uh, we do have uh, vaccine misinformation and disinformation um, going on um, around Indonesia, in remote areas in Indonesia. And we do all we can, you know, uh, to have all hands on deck and uh, be very well informed about the benefits of uh, vaccines, about the benefit of uh, social distancing and uh, also locking in uh, those gains that we have. Uh, and I, th I think uh, like what Melissa has said is that uh, we want to build the institution so that it is more uh, resilient uh, going forward in the future. Uh, so even though there are uh, partisanship about the details of the uh, strategy, but the main goal I think remains the same, uh, which it's uh, we want in Indonesia, we want a region that is prosperous and, and healthy. And without health, I think we cannot be prosperous. And in order for us to achieve that, we have uh, to have a strong institution. And, and through locking in those gains, including uh, in, the, in our budget, in our uh, system, um, in our infrastructure, uh, I think that's the way to go. And it's, it's really hard to uh, turn back the clock once it is locked in. Um, like, like, uh, like that. Uh, that includes the creation of uh, manufacturing capacity, which we are partnering with a number of um, international biopharma uh, companies and also uh, uh, international um, other countries as well uh, in order to build our manufacturing um, capacity in vaccines and, 
and um, other medicines as well. What does that so, mean, and what can we expect to see in like two years, would you say? Uh, in two years, uh, for example, we have uh, one of our company, um, Biopharma, uh, which can now manufacture about 3 billion uh, doses of uh, vaccines, 14 different vaccines, and they export to 150 countries. We are expecting for them to um, expand their capacity to have uh, the capacity to manufacture mRNA vaccines, not just for COVID, but for future pandemic or, or or other uh, disease um, down the line as well. And we have a good uh, logistical, advanced logistical network to distribute those vaccines in Indonesia and throughout the Southeast Asia. So uh, we're expecting in the next uh, couple of years to build that capacity together with our partners. Thank you. Jennifer, um, are you seeing this phenomenon of a rethink and a, a higher risk of, of slipping into complacency? And, and what do you see as, as the creation of these new capacities and distributed hubs around the world, and what's Pfizer's role going to be? Sure. Thanks for the question, Steve. I think with respect to, you know, kind of where we go from here and what the rethink looks like, it's becoming increasingly important for us on the private sector side to really have a good understanding of where government's needs are. So we are in very close and continual communication with governments throughout the region to understand really what do the COVID metrics look like, what does the uptake look like in terms of vaccination, as well as the, the, the need in terms of therapeutics. Um, one of the things in particular that we found, um, you know, kind of optimistic is that we're increasingly seeing a breakdown of siloed thinking and conversation between health and finance ministries, um, such that, you know, even in some of the multilateral fora, ASEAN, conversations with ADB, et cetera, um, and within APEC, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're seeing that there's a lot more discussion around the importance of health preparedness as a prerequisite for driving future economic growth in the region. So this is something that, from the private sector perspective, we are very keen to continue to support. Um, including with respect to the G20, obviously, which Indonesia is host of this year. Um, so I would say looking ahead, you know, we, we very much want to be a partner with governments to help them support their pandemic preparedness and potential future pandemic preparedness efforts. Um, on the question of uh, manufacturing capacity and what the future looks like, um, what I would say here is, you know, one of the reasons that Pfizer was able to mobilize so quickly um, to respond to the current pandemic situation is because of utilizing a very streamlined manufacturing process. Um, as folks know, you know, we've never brought a vaccine to market as quickly as we've done um, in history, as we've been able to do with the COVID vaccine. And that was intentional because we were able to, you know, really mobilize our internal capabilities um, and, and really bring to bear the, the full suite of global resources we have around the world. I think, you know, with that being said, um, we're continuing the R&D, the clinical trials with respect to new and emerging variants, including BA2, um, and we're expecting, you know, additional data readouts in the very near future on those. Um, and I would also note that even beyond vaccines, um, you know, we are continuing to partner from a manufacturing perspective on the therapeutic side. So I think as many are aware, we have a product Paxlovid, which is an antiviral product for the treatment of COVID. And uh, we have announced partnership with uh, the medicines patent pool, whereby we have now, um, in partnership with MPP, there's been an announcement that we're supporting um, sublicensing for um, that technology um, to enable greater access globally, including in some of the low and middle income countries in, in ASEAN. You. Yeah, those licensing arrangements are quite hopeful. Yeah. They've just announced. I wanted to just mention your boss, Albert Burla, just published uh, Moonshot his uh, memoir of this period, and uh, we're hoping to host him this month Fantastic. Uh, on an online conversation around that, and we're excited about that. Faith. Well, I think on the first question, as far as sort of how, if, 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 uh, if, all of, if we're all becoming too complacent and sort of now that we've um, largely gotten through this crisis, I mean, I think for whatever the next crisis is around the corner, you know, the industry has long had the perspective, like other panelists have, have said, that um, private sector, governments, institutions, international organizations should continue to come together to put in place the kinds of protocols and standards that would um, allow us to respond to a future pandemic, a natural disaster, you know, a man-made crisis, um, whatever it is, as far as these challenges we have to, to our economies and, and to the industry. So I think that would be the response on the first question. As far as how the industry has changed in the last couple of years, um, you know, we've seen 
Traveler preferences change. Like I would said earlier, you know, demand for travel remains quite high and quite resilient, but the new flexibilities, for example, in work arrangements allow for different kinds of trips. So um, there's this new category called leisure travel, so business and leisure combined that's emerged. People are tending to take longer trips. They're not tied to the office necessarily for that Monday through Friday, nine to five work week. And so being responsive to that, I think there's also a piece, uh, again, the private sector working with governments and educational institutions on reskilling and upskilling the workforce, so making sure that those who are coming into the industry now are able to, they have the skills and they have the technical capabilities to be able to, to deliver sort of the, the latest as far as health and safety practices um, and the things that the consumers are, are requesting. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we're at the end of our uh, time. Uh, I apologize. We could continue, I think, fruitfully for quite a bit longer. So please join me in thanking our our four esteemed guests here. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Sure. Thank you. Morning again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have a chance to have a conversation with Dr. Kurt Campbell. Um, Dr. Campbell has had many titles. Uh, he was my boss when he was Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary at, at DOD. He has headed esteemed think tanks, including CNAS, and was a VP here. He's headed uh, 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 the Asia Group. He has taught at Harvard. He has written terrific books, including uh, one about the, the pivot that, of which he was the architect, President Obama's uh, pivot to Asia. But I don't think there's any role that he's played uh, more consequential than the one uh, he's playing right now. Um, Dr. Campbell is Deputy Assistant Secretary to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council, a position he was appointed to on day one of the Biden administration. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, have this chance to, to talk with you, Kurt. Great, Ted. And Ted, thank you very much. I don't know if this microphone is on, is it? I, can you hear? I, Apologize. Is it good? Good. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I also just want to return the compliment. Great that you've taken up this new role uh, at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council after decades of consequential diplomatic engagement, and it's great to be back at CSIS as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, so let's. We're going to jump right in with Russia, Ukraine. You are occupied day in and day out at the White House. Uh, dealing with the aftermath of the Russian invasion. And can you tell us some of the, so how, what your efforts have been uh, with regard to Indo-Pacific friends and allies in uh, seeing how to make sure that they are part of the solution and not part of the problem? Great, uh, thank you, Ted. And I, I think as uh, everyone understands that what we're witnessing, uh, this tragedy, this, uh, 
uh, terrible conflict in Ukraine uh, for many of us just brings back sort of historic memories of the 1930s, but had sort of a combination feel of both 1939 and 1989, both deep peril and anxiety, and also some prospects for um, uh, what comes next. I will say that the, that the issue that, that has re received most of the focus has been the unprecedented solidarity between the United States and European uh, allies and partners, the, the ability to work together, um, and uh, it has been inspirational and um, deeply impactful, both on the battlefield and with respect to the surrounding diplomacy and the sanctions policies. But I think what sometimes uh, Ted gets a little lost in um, uh, the overarching picture is that what we've also seen in, is unprecedented Asian and Indo-Pacific engagement and solidarity on some of the challenges that we're facing in um, Ukraine. And it just, I think it, it's important to pause a moment and reflect on what we've seen. Much of it, um, not uh, coordinated, but basically inspired by countries acting either uh, independently or together. So in the aftermath of the, um, uh, of the tragedy, we've seen a number of things take place among key partners in the Indo-Pacific. The first has been steps to support some of the energy challenges presented in Western Europe. So complex natural gas swaps between key partners in Northeast Asia to provide support in this immediate challenging period of late winter uh, in uh, Western Europe, and that has been impactful. Secondly, uh, almost uh, all our key uh, partners and allies have joined with uh, G7 related sanctions, both financial, some institutional and individual, that has been deeply impactful. Uh, also, we've also seen uh, uh, Japan, Australia and others uh, follow through on specifics associated with Swiss sanctions and other specifics uh, related to the banking uh, community. Uh, other countries have stepped up dramatically. I see uh, my good friend Paul here, the ambassador, Australia. Uh, has uh, not just uh, stepped up with respect to sanctions relief, but has sent uh, support for the Ukrainians. Prime Minister Morris had a great quote last week, we're not just sending our prayers, but we're sending ammo. Um, a, a tremendous response throughout the region, even countries, Ted, in Southeast Asia, like Singapore, obviously with the Prime Minister visiting last week, have uh, joined in this overarching effort. And I think a deep recognition that um, this challenge uh, is not just the challenge for Europe, but a challenge for the Indo-Pacific. So you'd ask yourself, why is this? Why are we seeing this degree of, I think I would call it common purpose. The first is that it's just undeniable. There is an uh, ubiquitous quality to what the Ukrainians represent, a tremendous sense of hope. It's deeply inspirational. That inspiration not only um, affects us in the West, in the United States, and other parts of Western Euro uh, uh, Europe, it's deeply impactful across Asia. We see it in almost every social media uh, uh, venue. We see it uh, uh, impacting uh, social commentary across Asia, a, de a deep sense of common, uh, you know, uh, concern about the travails of the Ukrainian people, the, the determination to support uh, wherever possible. The second is, is uh, a quality that I think um, we are seeking to build on. There often, Ted, is a tendency to think about these theaters, uh, Europe and uh, the Indo-Pacific or Asia, as completely separate and, and that somehow that you have to make choices between uh, two geographic areas. But in many respects, what we're finding is that um, these two critical theaters are linked in important ways, in ways that would, su would suggest that in some uh, features it is one theater, a, a sense of, of that uh, these key countries are invested in an operating system that has supported uh, the uh, maintenance of peace and stability, uh, a larger project with respect to uh, uh, the norms of global governance. We could go on about that, but just 
the the I, I have been struck in this new job, and Ted, I, I obviously do a lot of diplomacy with partners uh, and allies across the Indo-Pacific and China. I also engage deeply with um, with countries in the Indo-Pacific, in in Europe, who want to learn more and are focused on the Indo-Pacific. And having done this for years, I see more. A uh, sense of common purpose and um, uh, joint efforts than I've ever seen before, and I think that's powerful uh, and important, and a critical feature of global governments. And then I would just say there's a third uh, uh, feature that that is perhaps unspoken, but is also critically important, and that is that uh, every country in Asia in the Indo-Pacific wants to um, ensure that Ukraine is a cautionary tale, that uh, no one contemplates again or in another theater some sort of operation that would be so destabilizing and so destructive. And I think that message has come through loud and clear. Um, I, I, I will also say though, Ted, what you've worked your life in Asia, it's still too early to make fundamental judgments about what are the uh, important lessons learned f uh, from this endeavor. The one that I'm most focused on, if I can be uh, uh, quite direct, is that the United States has in the past, um, you know, uh, made clear its determination to focus on the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific only to be detoured or to focused elsewhere on other pressing challenges. When President Biden began his meeting last week with uh, 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 Prime Minister Lee, the first thing he said is that we understand that the dominant arena for engagement for the United States in the 21st century will be the Indo-Pacific, and we are determined to not veer from that course. For now, that requires us to be deeply engaged both in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific, at the same time finding these linkages between these two theories, but recognize that we must not turn our attention away from the critical technological, trade, uh, security, political, diplomatic uh, 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 field uh, that presents itself uh, to us in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. So what I uh, hear you saying, Kurt, is the implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy that you have put out to the world goes ahead and that uh, it won't be deterred. We will be engaging in, in uh, the, the intersection of these two theaters, but the, the movement will continue. Uh, part, of the, part of the Indo Pacific strategy refers to an empowered and unified ASEAN. Um, what is it that the United States uh, can do to uh, help uh, facilitate that goal? Yeah, thanks, Ted. Well, obviously, I think, as, as many of you know, the idea of a strategy is to have component pieces that work in a kind of harmony together. So a lot of investment and focus on the United States. We're deeply engaged right now in the CHIPS Act and other elements of domestic investment in technology, trying to focus more on creating uh, spheres of bipartisanship where we agree on common purpose. I'm grateful, Ted, one of the things that you have done is reached out to the Hill to make clear that this is an area of common purpose for all Americans. I think working with allies and partners individually, working with them together is, uh, is critical. New venues like um, uh, the Quad are important, but foundationally, uh, from our perspective, what is critical is a strong, vital, innovated, committed approach uh, to, to ASEAN, and that's what we're seeking. I think what, what the President has indicated uh, is he very much wants to host um, uh, the ASEAN leaders uh, here in uh, Washington in the spring. Uh, I think you all have planned big events. Sometimes getting everyone's calendar together can be challenging, but that is what we are determined to do, uh, in which, uh, uh, in addition to deep engagement with the business community, with key stakeholders on Capitol Hill, that the leaders will have an opportunity to engage across a, a broad front, not only with the president, but with other key players uh, uh, inside uh, the U.S. government. And our idea here, Ted, is to broaden and deepen the 
scope and engagement of the U.S. government uh, with respect to ASEAN. And that means everything. So we, we tend to focus more on diplomacy or security, but we see so many avenues of potential engagement, whether it be on climate change or investment. So we have a newly empowered DFC that's determined to step up its game in Southeast Asia. We see opportunities with respect to everything from support for microlending to forestry. There's such a broad array of things that the United States uh, and ASEAN can work together. We want very much to support the work that you've supported on education, uh, educational opportunities for ASEAN students to come to the United States. So, so we do believe um, that ASEAN is foundational, Ted, that, that it has to be the center of our overall engagement uh, in Asia, and we're excited about hosting this first ever event in Washington. I, I, it's a little bit like planning a very big event. You get anxious about the place settings and the like, but I'm confident that once we are able to put this in play, this will help um, essentially um, project uh, the, you know, the future of our relationship with ASEAN very much in a forward direction. I think um, we share your confidence that it will. It'll be the first time to have the ASEAN leaders in Washington uh, for such a summit. Um, Maybe I could, uh, we have Ambassador Bianchi here, uh, but maybe I could ask, since that is part of this process, um, what is the strategic significance of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? Well, it's, it's great that you've asked Sarah, who's a wonderful partner, tremendously energetic, and very much committed to this effort uh, at USTR. And um, as importantly, a very close, um, confidant and uh, the president respects her views enormously and the fact that she's going to play a leading role here is deeply significant. Look, Ted, I, I, I don't think it is a secret to anyone in this audience that trade and economic issues are contentious. Uh, they are, uh, they are um, uh, debated and divisive between our two parties. Um, that is undeniable. But it is also undeniable that it is essential for the United States to put together an optimistic, engaged, focused effort that sends a message that we are, uh, we're committed to the region and that we want to work on common approaches, common standards to create mutual prosperity and to do it in a way that's politically viable, uh, not only for the countries involved, but for us. And um, that is not an easy path. I, it, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that's, I, I find myself in, often in situations where um, you walk into a room and you're not exactly sure, you know, who's going to support, who's, who's going to have uh, 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 a different perspective. But I, I'm finding more and more when you sit down and, and talk to key stakeholders, there is an understanding that this is an essential feature of American strategy. It's just undeniable and we need to understand it, face it, do our best to implement and that's exactly what we're going to do and you will see we're deeply involved and Ted, you've been, you've been involved in this, deeply involved in consultations now with both countries and key stakeholders and we're looking forward to a uh, high level engaged uh, effort uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you and I, we won't steal the thunder from the, the next panel, but I can tell you that our members, uh, 178 members of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, uh, we're hearing a lot from them and a lot of support for uh, the administration's undertaking. Uh, while you mentioned the Quad earlier, and I want to come back to that, the Quad and AUKUS mm -hmm. and ASEAN, the Venn diagrams don't exactly uh, connect. So when you look at these pieces of the regional architecture, uh, how do you reconcile them? Well, well, look. Ted, I think the, the key is intersecting, intersecting overlapping. We're, we're going to find um, uh, uh, missions in which some groups of countries are primarily focused on technology or on climate change and other groupings that will be more focused on security or trade. I, I think the idea is to have a web of these interactions that are 
um, uh, in many respects, reinforcing more generally. So the Quad is an unofficial gathering. It is, uh, uh, we think it's of critical importance. We're built habits of cooperation across uh, key countries, key maritime democracies. Um, we believe that engagement with, in, uh, with India in particular is central and critical for the 21st century. We are very supportive of that and we have doubled down on engaging closely uh, with Indian partners going forward. But it is also the case that AUKUS is, has a very uh, specific security component associated with that. Um, uh, and it bridges a uh, key partner in uh, Europe, in, in Great Britain, uh, with our longstanding uh, partner in Australia on a specific security uh, uh, set of engagements. But even that trilateral forum, um, uh, Ted, we believe will have opportunities for participation in other technologies and military engagements with key countries that seek to join. So I think what we're primarily interested in are not closed architectures, but those that uh, encourage participation, that are about um, uh, promoting common purposes and uh, approaches to what we believe will be a complex security and political uh, uh, arena in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, last question for me, and then I wanna make sure that folks uh, from this audience have a chance, and we've got a microphone right over there. But one of the pieces of that architecture is the G20, mm -hmm. uh, chaired by Indonesia this year. Uh, it's an important opportunity to get the world going uh, and to, to pursue economic recovery. Uh, but how do we square the circle? Because the, the G20 includes Russia. Look, uh, Ted, it's an important question to raise at this juncture. Um, uh, I, I, all I can tell you is, and, and no fundamental decisions have been made, but I think you have heard the outrage uh, across the international community at what we are witnessing in Ukraine. So it's difficult, frankly, to imagine an environment where President Putin is um, invited in for a civilized uh, discussion about how to promote uh, development and work on climate change. I'll leave that um, to the future, but I, I would say that the urgencies and uh, the tragedy uh, of, of what we are facing now uh, in Ukraine are, are, are real and, and undeniable, and there will be international consequences. Yeah. Thank you. Let's start with John Brandon's question. Uh, what do you think would be the biggest deliverable the U.S. could give ASEAN to strengthen the relationship? What is the biggest deliverable ASEAN could give the United States? Hmm. I think that the United States, uh, and I'm hopeful we will work closely with the DFC and other vehicles, I, I think we, we need to support both continuing efforts to ensure that the region has safe and effective vaccines, particularly in this period, although we you know, think that, you know, I, I'm not sure where we are in our journey here in the United States, but it's clear in the world and particularly in key places like Southeast Asia, more work needs to be done. The Quad has played a role in trying to provide uh, vaccines uh, through an ambitious agenda that, that we've laid out um, over the course of the last year, and we want to continue with that. I also believe that financing and uh, technology uh, partnerships on issues like climate change will be essential. And I also believe that educational opportunities are critical. So I'm not sure that I can settle on any one thing. I think, in fact, the key to an effective engagement between the United States and ASEAN is that it is multifaceted and has many strands. And in fact, that is the key that we seek when the leaders come to Washington is not any one deliverable, but a series of substantial efforts that again, broadens and deepens the partnership and the relationship between the United States and these critical countries in ASEAN. And I think the greatest gift that they could give us is to come to the summit. <laughs> so <laughs> if we schedule it, that, that we're able to, to host everyone and it, with a tremendous sense of, of, of uh, gratitude and uh, hope. Thank you. 
I think a word of congratulations is in order. The visit by Prime Minister Lee, when you issued the, the, the joint statement and the, the two leaders held their, their press event, um, it was deeply substantive. For those of us who, you know, yeah. policy wonks who follow these things, uh, it was so impressive, the, the array of issues on which we're cooperating. If, if you wouldn't mind me just making a point on this, Ted, what, if you look at the series of engagements that we've had, over the course of the last year, beginning with uh, the first visit of the Japanese leader, the Korean summit. Uh, we are hosting now in Washington the Korean uh, transition team that's here. Um, everything that we've tried to do in the Quad. What I think what we are seeing is across the region a desire not simply to do um, uh, uh, general uh, words in a uh, polite document, but but really consequential commitments to um, deal with challenges that people are facing, uh, to try to uphold uh, 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 norms that we all now, I think, uh, recognize are significant, to be ambitious about areas of mutual cooperation, and to try to sustain and build what we have labored for for decades. And I'm proud of that, and I'm also proud of the fact that organizations like yours have, have gotten in and really committed to building and deepening a relationship. I, I will just say for a moment, um, you know, we now hold a monthly engagement with with ASEAN ambassadors something that you know in the past was was you know occasional engagement but now deep high level engagements with key players in the US government and it's been Ted and his organization that have been right behind us finding uh, opportunities to fall in behind to support initiatives to ensure that these um, engagements are not simply words but are real and following through on commitments made. And we will be calling on uh, TED and ASEAN and CSIS, frankly, as we head into the period of uh, making sure that the Leader Summit here in Washington is a success. Well, it's, our, it's a privilege to be able to help. We are deeply invested in your success. Uh, we know the time pressures on you are great, Dr. Campbell. Uh, really grateful that you could come. And Thank you. I'm sorry to keep you all waiting earlier today, but you know, one of the challenges in a job like this is you don't have as much control over your time as <laughs> you would like, but I really appreciate you waiting around. Thank you. We're glad it was worth the wait. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Ted. It means thank a lot. you very much. Thank you. It was good. good. It was good. He had been here since, well, he did New York in 2019. Yeah. So because of COVID, he hadn't been 2019 here. 2019 was the last time he was here? Yeah, at the end. And it was the UN General Assembly. Washington was 2017. Uh, 
Um, do you normally come from the Festival Administration? Yep. Like it's the COVID? Yep. So they have to sort of hold yep. off. All right. Okay. Well, w welcome back. Um, I'm Matthew Goodman. I uh, am senior vice president here at CSIS, and I run the economics program. And delighted to be hosting this uh, panel on economics and business in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as as is the want of the economics uh, world, we're always the last panel of the day. Uh, but in this case, uh, you're you're going to be get your money's worth. This is going to be a terrific panel for three reasons. One, because as um, Kurt Campbell said. Uh, everyone in this room knows and everyone online watching knows that economics and trade are critical to U.S. engagement in the Indo-Pacific and to it's, it's top of mind for all of our partners in the region. And so uh, it's, it's an increasingly important uh, subject uh, for, for all of us. Uh, secondly, the digital economy, which is what we're going to focus on in particular here, uh, is obviously uh, hugely important. Uh, we're, we're using the digital economy now through this, uh, this um, platform. It's, uh, it's a, a critically important role in uh, economic growth, in recovery from the pandemic. And there have been a lot of changes over the last couple of years that, that I think we're going to talk about and explore here. What there isn't is a universally or an internationally agreed set of rules and norms uh, for the digital economy. There are bits and pieces of rules, but there's no uh, agreed international rules. I sometimes call this the sort of the missing fifth pillar of the global governance system after the three Bretton Woods pillars and the sort of energy and climate arrangements that started in the 70s. Um, we're now faced with a, a big gap in the digital economy um, in, in rules and norms. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, the reason this is going to be a terrific panel is we've got just a first class group of panelists. Really, this is about the best uh, I've ever uh, had the privilege of moderating, and also the first time in two years plus that I've been able to be up on stage, so I'm <laughs> delighted to, uh, to be here. And so without further ado, I'm going to just quickly go down the line and introduce literally kind of by title, because I think most of these, well, all of these folks are well known to, to this audience. Um, so immediately to my left, your right, is Ambassador Sarah Bianchi, who is Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, um, responsible for Asia and a number of uh, sectoral um, functional issues issues as well. Um, delighted to have you with us, Ambassador Bianchi. Um, Ambassador Ashok Mirpuri, again, very well known to a CSAS audience, uh, is Ambassador of the United States from the Republic of Singapore. Uh, he's been here for a decade now, which is um, uh, sort of in the want of, of um, of Singaporean ambassadors, and we're delighted that you're not quite the dean yet, are you? Okay. The, not yet. Okay, a little bit, little bit longer. Um, that won't be long. Um, and then finally, last but not least, is Ambassador Karan Batia, who is Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy at um, a small company called Google. Um, and um, Karan, as many people know, was in Sarah's position in the George W. Bush uh, administration, among other um, uh, distinguished uh, government service that he he has done. So we're, we've got a, just a powerhouse panel here. And I'm going to really just do kind of two things here in the end. We're going to sort of try and compress because there's not a lot of time. So the first round, I just want to, before we get into the digital issues, I just want to talk, since we're the economics group, a little bit about the economic effects of the pandemic and how we're coming out of that. So I want to actually start with Ambassador Mirpuri because you're representing a country on the ground in the region. How has COVID-19 affected Singapore's economy and maybe more broadly um, the Southeast Asian region? How has your government responded and, and what lessons have you sort of learned from this experience in terms of economic policy? Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you for inviting my, me back for an in-person thing. I don't have to unmute myself. I'm just here all the time, which is very good to have people, fresh faces looking at you. I think that, you know, like every country in the world that was impacted by the pandemic, uh, Southeast Asian countries, including Singapore, went through a very difficult phase. We, ha we are slowly coming back out of it. I think first April in many ways marked a sort of mini bang in Southeast Asia. I wouldn't call it a big bang. As countries started to open up, travel has resumed in the region. And it, I think the key differentiating factor of the two years of the pandemic is what did you do during those two years? Obviously, you had to deal with health. You had to get people vaccinated. You did all the social distancing. But what other adjustments did you use that time for to prepare for the future? 
and uh, the earlier panel was really about the new normal. Yes, we're normal, but we are new. And what did you do in that time to get your country ready? And that's something that, you know, Singapore in many ways, we go through these ups and downs of economic cycles. We tend to use the down periods of economic cycles to prepare for the next surge up. So in that case, particularly since we are talking about, and we will be talking about a digital, we really re-looked at what we had to do to transform the Singapore economy. Make sure, first of all, we, we remained open. There were no controls on movement of goods. There were no sorts of uh, export controls as uh, goods and services moved around the region. But we also then started to transform the domestic workforce, started looking at the uh, technology infrastructure, opened up new opportunities for research and technology in Singapore. I think that can sometimes be the key differentiating factor, even as you are dealing with the pandemic. And I, again, I heard an earlier panelist say about, speak about Singapore's very high vaccination rates. I think that has been helpful in our population, that we were able to get the vaccines out early, that there was a deep trust in the government, that people went out there and took the vaccines. There was a little bit of, you, you can't go out if you don't take your vaccine as well. So that helps make sure people get their vaccines quite quickly. And, but now we're starting to see the resumption of travel. Uh, Changi Airport is starting to open up. Many of you are familiar with Changi Airport. May not, you may not have been there for a while. We're starting to see travel. In fact, Ambassador Tai is just in Singapore today and had meetings with the Prime Minister and various other ministers today that she was able to get in uh, with no real difficulty. The other thing that we used the time this two years on was keep a certain focus on regional integration. Again, as each country sort of hunkered down and said, I've got to deal with COVID, I've got to deal with the medical and health issues, we kept that focus on regional integration. So RCEP got launched, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, CPP, TPP carried on. So many of these things really have to carry on in parallel as you work the health issues. How do you then come out? And I think the region is well placed now to sort of uh, have a fairly good 2022. Of course, the situation in Ukraine has complicated issues around supply chains and some of the energy issues, and that may slow down some, some of the uh, recovery. But I think the region is ready to go, and I, that's where we're starting to see some of the excitement. Later this year, again in the region, we will be hosting the G20. Indonesia will host the G20. Thailand will host APEC. Cambodia will host e the EAS. That external engagement with the region will continue. Continue. So I think overall it was a very difficult two years as now countries are starting to come out as they've started to focus on what needs to be the next sort of three to five year program. That's what we're focusing on. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. Well, you covered a lot of important ground and I've got about 15 things I'd like to follow up with you on, but we don't have time. So I'm going to ask um, Ambassador Bianchi. Um, so uh, from your perspective at USTR, uh, obviously the biggest effect of the pandemic maybe is to the disruption it's caused to trade and to supply chains. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and particularly how that affects your work in the Indo-Pacific um, over, over this past period and what is the U.S. doing? about this. Absolutely. I think, uh, it's, uh, as the ambassador said and is, is very clear, um, supply chain disruptions were a really big problem, uh, continue to be uh, a challenge. Obviously, uh, the Ukraine situation is complicating uh, that even more. Uh, we've been very focused in this administration on supply chain <coughs> challenges really from the get-go when the president uh, issued an early executive order uh, on supply chain uh, resiliency. Uh, that came back uh, with the number of uh, focuses on semi whether it was semiconductor manufacturing, uh, large capacity batteries, critical minerals, pharmaceuticals, all of these uh, critical issues, um, and really led us to a number of recommendations, some of which uh, increasing public investment in R&D, um, uh, modern standards. Uh, uh, Kurt talked a lot about uh, the Development Finance Corporation. We're really trying to do a lot of work uh, uh, there. At USTR, we have uh, launched our own supply chain uh, task force at the, at the request of the president. And that really looks at a number of things that we could do uh, to strengthen supply chains uh, uh, going forward so we don't have this kind of disruption in the future. 
So for example, things around trade facilitation, uh, e-commerce, e-contracting, all of those kinds of things that can really help smooth the way. We have uh, begun to talk to our partners that we have FTAs with to see uh, if there are things we can do uh, for facilitation, um, trade facilitation there. Uh, things like the Trade and Technology Council that we've launched, uh, that's uh, a bit more uh, focused on the Europe side, but all of these things are really designed to strengthen uh, the uh, uh, capacity for the future. I would also just highlight, and Kurt, uh, Dr. Campbell highlighted a few of these points around some of the legislation that the administration has fought for, whether it's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, uh, again, um, resources for semiconductor, all of these things. Um, uh, the CHIPS Act, I think, would help. And so I think we're really uh, trying to take lessons learned from the pandemic and strengthen uh, our approach for the future. Okay, great. Well, again, lots to uh, to talk about there, um, and we've certainly at CSAS, Bill Ryan, Bill Reinch, and, and I and others have have done a lot of work on supply chains, and very interested in, in following up on some of that if we have time. But let me um, bring Karan into the conversation. Actually, before I do that, let me just say to people online: if you have uh, questions, feel free to use the um, I guess the the question function that's in, on the screen in front of you, um, and we'll be able to hopefully get to some of those questions afterwards. So Karan, just as a business matter, it's obviously been a, a big impact on your business. You have a big footprint in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Can you just talk about how that's, uh, how the COVID experience, and maybe a little bit of Ukraine as well, how this has disrupted and changed uh, your business uh, itself before we get into sort of the digital governance questions that I know are Great. interesting. Thanks, Matt. Again, thank you. Uh, to you and, and CSIS for putting this on and, and uh, inviting me. Um, look, I mean, the last couple of years have been clearly a period of uh, substantial turbulence in the, in the global economy, first, you know, wrought by COVID, and then uh, more recently, obviously, Ukraine. Uh, you know, there is uncertainty in the global economy and all of that. So there, is, there are plenty of challenges to talk about out there, the supply chain issues that Sarah referenced as well. But what I, what I will say is if you step back and sort of look at where the economy was, and particularly sort of the, the internet economy uh, a few years ago and where we see it today and where we see it going forward, including, and maybe even particularly in the Southeast Asia region, there's a reason for tremendous optimism. I mean, we have seen happen in the last few years sort of a degree of development of integration of, of people coming online and utilizing online tools in a short period of time that you know uh, would have taken many many more years in the absence of of the pandemic so while it has been an incredible human tragedy it has also i think sort of provided a bit of jet fuel to the digitalization of the uh, of the economy um, you know, the numbers that we, we, we do a study each year with Tomasic and Bain, um, and for those of you who are interested out there, you can check it out at economysea.withgoogle.com or just Google, <laughs> just Google it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, in a nutshell, I, I mean, some of, the, some of the data is just stunning. You know, we've got 40 million new internet in, uh, users in Southeast Asia last year alone. Uh, internet penetration has now gone up to 75%. Um, so, so a lot of, of, of positive development. I will say that with that comes a set of opportunities and responsibilities for companies out there. So just very quickly, you know, how have we approached it as a company? I think really is three things. First of all, tools. We need, we need more and better tools uh, to help support these economies and particularly the small businesses as they grow, which is one of the reasons we've doubled down in uh, the availability of our tools for, uh, for small businesses, both in Southeast Asia and in the United States. And every bit of evidence we have is that those businesses that are connected do far better than those that are not. They are able to withstand shocks like the pandemic and they're able to grow. Uh, you know, they are four times as 
likely to export, for instance, if you are a digitally, digitally connected small business. So point one is getting them tools. Point two is training. It's a huge focus for us because if people are not trained, they are not going to be able to take advantage of it. We, our own program is to have trained 50 million people since in Southeast Asia since, uh, or in APAC as a whole, excuse me, since 2015. More to be done there in partnership with governments, but I think that's great. And then the last is just infrastructure. You know, there's been a lot of investment there. There's more that remains to be done. A lot of uh, investment by private sector companies like ours, but also by the governments as well. Okay, great. Um, and um, uh, I think, um, you know, your points about, well, I want to follow up specifically on SMEs in a second, but, but just to say something about the training, which is so important and something that I think American uh, companies bring to, uh, to this region and, and uh, to the world that is often underestimated or under, uh, not known about, and I think it's a critical part of our offering as well, so, so Thank I'm, you. I'm glad to hear you're doing that. Um, okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me sort of now dive a little bit more into the digital uh, story, and um, Ambassador Mir Puri, let me start from you, because um, you know, obviously COVID-19 accelerated development, as, as Karan said, of the digital economy, digitization has, has expanded. Um, you know, and how has Singapore sort of navigated that transition and leveraged your digital economy to respond to COVID? Um, and then I've got a sort of, well, let me just throw it in now because then you can, you can answer these two things together. I mean, Singapore has been a leader in uh, digital rulemaking and, and s setting uh, rules and, and norms uh, through your work in trade agreements bilaterally and, and sort of regionally. You have, um, uh, you have uh, this digital economy partnership uh, agreement uh, or DIPA, which uh, brings you together with, for now, uh, Singapore and Chile. There are others who are interested in joining, um, and, uh, and which has a whole bunch of modules of work in the digital economy. Um, so you've really done a lot there, and I'm just interested in sort of beyond sort of how you've dealt with the digitization and, and, and deployed it about your strategy for div digital governance work as well. Well, Leo, let me just cover three quick things. First is domestically in Singapore again. I think we were very concerned that as people went through that COVID period and had to use much more digital, that there was a group of people that didn't have access to the internet, that were uncertain how to use digital tools, an older population, one less familiar with it. So we did set up a Singapore digital office with digital ambassadors going out, helping people in order to make sure you close the gaps. And I think that's very important to remember because we get so involved in sort of the big picture and big digital agreements, you need to, in the end, make sure that all of these help the people on the ground. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to do some of that digital transformation for our own people. So that Singapore Digital Office was one key part of how we, one of the tools that we use. The next stage was working within ASEAN as well. And you spoke about what companies have done in the region and Google came out with this excellent report. But so what Singapore has been doing, particularly with the U.S., we have a U.S.-Singapore third country training program uh, partnership that helps Singapore and U.S. trainers work in the region about what can be done in terms of digital. The key platform for that is the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, again, using digital to connect people in the region to make sure, and although this was launched before COVID, we made sure that during COVID this smart city network can continue so that you are going into second and third tier cities around the region, giving training to officials, not just businesses, to make sure they understand how to deal with the new digital world. The third one, and this is the most important, probably the most exciting part of what uh, we've been doing with a number of partners, is digital agreements. Singapore has a free trade agreement with the United States that was signed in 2004. In 2004, we all did not have a phone in our pockets. So it was a very different world in 2004. It's not even 20 years ago. So we. You know, we needed to complement these FTAs that we have, and Singapore has a whole range of FTAs with digital agreements. And we have found partners across the region that are working with us. You mentioned DIPA, the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement with New Zealand and Chile. Several other countries are now keen to join that, including China and Canada and others. So we're seeing how can we expand the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement. We have done bilateral digital agreements. One of our most comprehensive is with Australia. 
which has got very detailed working groups to follow through on the digital agreement. We have done a digital agreement with the UK. We have done one with the ROK. And even with the EV EU, we've started discussing this digital partnership agreement. So we think that's really, while we have these FTAs, we need to complement it with the digital agreements that, that are there. But the big prize is really the US. How do we get the US into these digital agreements? Uh, do we do it bilaterally? Can we do it multilaterally? Because while you complement Singapore for setting the standards, in many ways the standards are set here in the US. How do you deal with AI? How do you deal with quantum computing? What are you doing about Internet of Things? I think we need to start building these common standards before the digital revolution gets ahead of us. And I think in this role, governments have to play a very important part. And this is what Singapore is very keen to do. Uh, you know, we, we can talk a little bit about IPEF, and I'll leave Sarah to, to take up some of the elements of the IPEF. But we think that in IPEF, you can have a very strong digital component of it, because that will help to build up some of the things that we are looking at across the region. OK, I am going to come back to uh, Ambassador Bianchi in a second on, on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, just to spell out IPEF. Um, and and, and the digital part of that in a second. But let me first um, let you think about that by, um, by asking Karan your perspective, because I know you have views about uh, digital governance, digital rules and norms in the region, and, and the approach that, that uh, Singapore has taken and that um, Ambassador Mirpuri just laid out. Is that a good direction? Is it something that the U.S. ought to be part of from your perspective? Well, Singapore certainly has been a leader in, in this space for, for a while and, and deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, I mean, what I, I think what I'd say, Matt, is the last, while we've seen this, this encouraging growth in terms of usage of digital technology, and by the way, not just in sort of the core internet company space, but really across uh, sectors. I mean, it is, it is impossible to almost think of any sector today that is not in some sense a digital sector. So let's just to define terms appropriately. At the same stage that we've seen that growth, we've also seen, I think, a really concerning explosion in the, what I would say is the, the number of discrete, bespoke, bifurcated rules governing digital presence, governing the internet around the world, um, and certainly in this region as well. So today, if you look at it, um, and there are there are groups globally that are looking that are looking at this. I know USTR uh, obviously just came out with its NTE report. There has been a substantial growth in the number of what are effectively trade barriers in this space, um, and even where they're not trade barriers, they are just it becomes incredibly difficult to scale uh, and capture effectively the benefits of that internet connectivity when you've got so many different regimes uh, coming forward. And so, uh, look, I think there has to be greater alignment uh, around this uh, within the region and cross-regionally between the United States and, uh, and APAC. And just to be clear, I would say this, you know, a company like Google may be one of the few companies that could actually comply with 30 or however many different regimes. Uh, we have the resources to be able to build the compliance capabilities and restructure products. It is really for the smaller, mid-size, you know, businesses for whom this becomes a effectively, you know, sort of a, a barrier to, to entry into the marketplace altogether. So, you know, we think of this digital space as being, okay, that's the next generation, but we still have the WTO rules, the existing rules to rely on. No. I mean, the reality is the way business happens today is if we don't reach a new set of agreements around these, because of the way that these sectors function, effectively we have lost that set of norms and rules and disciplines that sort of enable us to operate. So, so we are, as you can imagine, big fans of IPEF, of, of anything. We would love even more ambition, but anything that is going to allow us to agree rules of the road that are going to enable business to continue to be conducted in a 21st century manner, we're supportive of. Okay, terrific. Um, and, and you've, again, anticipated a question about the SME angle on this, which I just will say now. <laughs> um, I agree that that's sort of critical part of this rulemaking story is, is, is enabling smaller companies, because big ones like you can figure it out, but, but, uh, but it's smaller ones that are going to have uh, the most need for these sort of uh, uh, aligned and, and, uh, and clear rules. Um, but Ambassador Bianchi, um, on that basis, based on um, what you heard from Ambassador Mirpuri and Karan and, and, um, and your work in this area, um, can you just lay out briefly the, the Biden administration's approach uh, to the digital 
uh, economy to digital uh, rulemaking and governance, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, should is the U.S. going to be mainly focused on the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework component? Are you doing other things? Are you going to join DEPA? Um, so give us a sense of your strategy. Uh Great. Well, thank you. And, and I agree with a lot of what has been said here about the needs and how difficult it is to have sort of a patchwork throughout um, the region and the world on these issues and uh, how companies like Google are, are able to uh, work through that, but that many others aren't. And so I think our, our real focus in the Biden administration is uh, to uh, really focus on this through the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, that's not exclusive, but particularly for this region uh, is uh, really our main approach. And uh, the way we are thinking this is an initiative that is, uh, as many of you know, co-chaired by uh, Secretary Romando and Ambassador Tai. And uh, we at USTR uh, lead what is called the trade pillar uh, of this initiative, uh, and there's other initiatives led by uh, commerce, such as infrastructure and uh, tax and anti-corruption and other issues. But uh, the digital really mostly resides within the trade pillar, and that is really where we are looking for uh, some of the rules, many of which uh, are are known to. Um, you know, in different parts of these agreements. Um, you know, they won't be a surprise to, you know, Singapore and others that have, have already uh, implemented many of them, but we'd, what we'd like to do is, uh, is to have an agreement to have them uh, throughout the region. And they're really important issues uh, embedded in um, in these, uh, in, in, in our trade pillar, uh, whether it's consumer trust in the digital economy, uh, access to information, uh, facilitation, facilitation of the use of digital uh, technologies, such as, again, strengthening provisions, electronic signatures, contracts and commerce, um, promoting a resilient and secure uh, digital infrastructure. Um, uh, and so where um, uh, we are um, uh, right now is, you know, in conversation with, with uh, our partners in the region, really engaging uh, interest, really explaining kind of how um, uh, we'd like to think about these issues. And we are really heartened by the response because I think there is a lot of interest uh, and, and there's broader pieces to the trade pillar, but, but digital is certainly a core component of it uh, and uh, heartened by not only uh, counterparts like uh, Singapore, who, uh, as was noted, is a, is a big leader on these issues, but uh, many ASEAN countries and others. And so we're really optimistic uh, that we can make a lot of progress. Uh, uh, obviously, timing and other things, there's a lot going on in the world right now, but um, this is something that we are really focused on. It's a major presidential initiative and um, really looking forward to, to getting it off the ground. Great. Well, let me just follow up, if I could, with sure. you about the... Um about the point about interest from the region, and maybe Ambassador Mipuri can also weigh in um, with a regional perspective. But um, you know, I think the U.S. is likely, or has traditionally in these digital um, undertakings, has sort of understandably um, sought you know high standards and and um, and and disciplines on things like data flows and data localization, yep. or against data localization requirements. Um, that's a you know reasonable ask or a fairly high ask of, of some countries in the region. Are you hearing back that that the countries are willing to sort of sign on to those commitments? Are they asking for something? It's been pretty clear that the administration is not. I know the ambassador Tai sort of answered this question a, a little bit differently than I think most had understood it, but I think we understood that there is not going to be an offer of greater access to the U.S. market as part of IPEF, which is the traditional thing that's sort of the offer that the U.S. makes to other countries to incentivize them to, to participate in these things. Right. Are we offering other incentives? How do you sort of answer that, that sure. question? Sure. Uh, no, a lot, of, a lot of great questions embedded in that. I think, first of all, we've gotten a lot of enthusiasm. I think just the uh, a lot of interest in having the United States just engaging in the region in this way um, has, uh, and so the response has been uh, uh, a very, um, 
you know, receptive uh, uh, just for that alone. I think on, on the digital issues, uh, there are a lot of countries uh, that, uh, like Singapore, there's some that already do uh, all of these things. There's others where it's more of a challenge. I think the way we're thinking about it now is we want to get this thing launched uh, and see where we can get. There are a number of different pillars uh, that countries can join and still be part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, even if they feel uh, they can't do the trade pillar. Um, so that may end up being the case in some. Uh, we do want to uh, offer uh, additional incentives, again, working, uh, whether it's technical assistance, working with uh, Development Finance Corporation, others, uh, to try to provide. But those are conversations that we will get in as we get underway. And uh, right now, what we're looking for is to have a big, inclusive uh, launch and, and figure out uh, where all these negotiations lead. And you're not ready to say when that launch is likely to be. I know there are a lot of, there's a question online about that as well. Everyone's interested in when Yeah, that's so happen. we are trying to land it as soon as we can. You know, the developments in the world have, have made all of these issues uh, challenging. And so uh, I would just say weeks, not months. <laughs> okay. And just one more question about that, the negotiating format as well. Once you launch, mm -hmm. is there going to be a sort of separate uh, streams of work in the four pillars and within your pillar, which has a lot of sub issues in it, is there going to be one kind of negotiation or several different uh, conversations with different partners? We're sorting a lot of that out. So first of all, uh, certainly a country can join um, one of the four pillars and not have to join the other. So that, that for sure is clear. Within the trade pillar, what we're looking for is someone, if a country decides to participate in that pillar, that they do it in its entirety. And so we will um, uh, have negotiations sort of based on that premise. Okay. Ambassador Murpuri, you know, how do you think the region and Singapore itself thinks about um, the offer and ask, uh, offer and request element of the digital agreement. Is there, is there, is this stuff that the, uh, the countries in the region want in the digital economy uh, in, in the IPEF um, as laid out so far in, in IPEF? Is it, do they expect something in return? What, how do you think people are looking at this? When the Prime Minister was here last week in his public comments, he made, I mean, even though the administration was very busy with the issues in Ukraine. I think he appreciated the fact that there was an opportunity to discuss about what's happening in the region. And then as you look back, and as the PM and we looked back at you know, what the administration has run through the Indo-Pacific strategy through 2021 into early 2022, I think they've put in place many of the elements. Sometimes, of course, you get delayed because of other global factors, but I think you appreciate everything this administration have done. You spoke earlier about my decade-long service over here, which means this is the third administration I'm dealing with. And administrations come in and they start onto a learning curve. This one has learned very quickly. They have got things in place very quickly. So there is, there is interest and excitement. The PM spoke about two things that I think the region is looking for over the next few months. One is to get the ASEAN summit with the president here in Washington, D.C., which Dr. Campbell spoke about earlier, as soon as that can go. And the other thing is IPEF, how important it is, because it relates to everything that we have consistently been saying that the, the region wants the U.S. to engage economically with Southeast Asia. That is really what the key is. And each administration that I've worked with, that, you know, uh, successive, Singapore has worked with these successive administrations, has really been what's the economic engagement with the region and what institutions can you develop. And I think I credit the USTR and Commerce for being quite creative about the structure of IPEF because there's sufficient flexibility uh, across the pillars and countries can see where they can come in. And once it gets launched and you do start the negotiations, I think it will start to build up, you know, the, the habits of negotiation and confidence building across the way. It's not, it's not ready set as you start. But I think as you, as you start, people want to engage with it, and we are seeing quite a significant amount of interest across the region, not just in Southeast Asia, but also outside Southeast Asia, in the digital pillars, but the other things. I mean, everyone's talking about supply chains over the past two years. Uh, the sort of 
again, the decarbonization agenda, which has worked into IPEF as well. Again, the PM did speak about that because the region has to deal with the issue of climate change and decarbonization. I know there's a panel tomorrow about that, so I don't want to get ahead of, of that conversation, but I think it's something that we really also have to understand and using that digital, the whole decarbonization, there are, there's so much to be done with the region. So I think there's interest. Countries will find that they may be more interested in the uh, energy decarbonization conversation at this stage than they are in the digital stage. But by putting it all there, that flexibility that the administration has brought into the conversation, I think that's very creative. And then we'll see where it goes from there. Yes, you can always say the standards, the, the offerings are not high enough, the incentives are not good enough, but we're really at that very early stage of the process. I'd see it at the end, where do, where, how quickly can we get to the end? What more do we need to do? Let's have it going as soon as we can, and then start into the real work and the process. Okay, uh, just uh, by the way, to clarify for folks, we're gonna go to noon, uh, 10 minutes after the original um, end time, just uh, because we were running a little behind, but uh, so we've got about seven or eight more minutes, and I'm about to turn to ask for questions from the audience or online, uh, but first let me ask Karan essentially about the same uh, set of issues uh, about IPEF and, and whether you think that's going to advance the ball on digital governance in a significant way. Is it enough, do you, and as a former negotiator, you know. Do you think uh, we're going to incentivize countries um, to, to participate in this, uh, given that we're going to be asking for a fair amount here? Um, is there something else we ought to be putting on the table? Is there a better well, approach, actually? Yeah, That's I mean, another question. I, I don't know that there's a better approach. I, I um, you know, to your question, but is it actually going to kind of do what it needs to do? I guess we'll, we'll see, uh, which is, you know, from my vantage point, having a, a, a strong emphasis on, you know, real meaningful commitments, particularly in the digital space, I think is gonna be absolutely critical. And, and so coming in with a high level of ambition on that I think is key. I will say from the perspective of, you know, a, a, a multinational technology company that is in, we manufacture, we are in the software side of things, so we're really in many different, you know, some reflect sort of broadly reflective. The, the issue of tariffs, I will tell you, is not one that I or my CFO wakes up or goes to sleep every night thinking about we're gonna do X in this country or Y in that country because of tariffs. Um, now we can talk about why that is. There is a, frankly, an enormous amount of good work that has been done for decades that have gotten us to the place of where we are. Um, so maybe it's that, but what does influence investment decisions, what does influence product decisions is are we going to have a domestic market in X country and a regional market that is going to allow us our investments to scale. And when you look at where the Asia Pacific region is today, in a sense, it is even in a less privileged position in this regard than Europe is, and Europe certainly there are significant differences between what we see in the US uh, or what we see in Europe and, and say the United States in terms of approaches to digital regulation. But in Europe, at least you have the European Union. You have one entity that you know, basically is setting those rules. In APAC, you've got, you know, at this point, dozens of countries setting rules of the road and it will become extremely difficult to make the business case for investing in each individual market if those rules are going to change. So I would say, I would hope that the countries that are potentially thinking about this are seeing it in terms of if we don't get into this, if we don't participate in the setting of the rules of the road, then they are not going, they will be, they will be at best sort of adjacent to the investment decisions that are going to be made by countries, both by companies on both sides, both in the United States looking at the region and in the region looking at the United States. So I'll pause there. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm gonna invite the audience if you'd like to ask a question. I know it's a little daunting, but there is a microphone there, don't be shy. Um, feel free to um, step up to the microphone if you wanna ask a question. Um, online, we're also welcoming question. I saw earlier Doug Palmer from Politico, who's usually here, uh, but, uh, but online asked about 15 questions, about 13, <laughs> 13 of which we, I think, got to. Um, he did ask a specific question, since you've, several of you have touched on APEC. Um, is the plan here to get the IPEF and the digital part of it uh, done by the time the U.S. hosts APEC in the fall of 2023? Is that, is that what we're aiming to do? 
<laughs> I think all of these timing questions are really, really difficult. We're, we, we're looking to launch IPEP as soon as we can, to have early harvests if we can. Um, so we're not designing the timing around each other per se, uh, but I think we hope to have made significant progress by the time that occurs in the next year. Okay. Um, anybody from the audience want to be brave enough to ask a question? Uh, there we go. Yes, sir. Please step up the microphone and if you'd identify yourself and then uh, ask your question. Dave Moss, I'm with uh, Hover Energy, and obviously energy underpins a lot of digital digital aspects, but it's an increasing challenge, particularly in Singapore. I know they've raised their tariffs five times in the past 15 months, and obviously of concern to Google, given your massive operations in data centers. And USTR, I know you promote energy exports. So I'm just curious what we can do to help address these challenges that are not uh, just unique to Singapore, but all over the Indo-Pacific. Okay. I don't know whether, Ambassador Mirpuri, you want to talk about You're the You're referring energy. to the carbon tax that we have raised. Yeah. It's not. Well, U.S. LNG powers the majority of your grid, I believe, and, and those prices keep going up as they do around the world. And in turn, tariffs keep on being raised. Uh, just the average cost of electricity is about 27 cents a kilowatt hour. Singapore does not subsidize energy. And we want whatever energy. I'm not particularly clear what aspect you're speaking about, but we do not subsidize energy. Uh, you pay the, the cost it is. We are helping companies start the energy transition. We want to meet the climate change goals that we have laid out. We have put in place a carbon tax and we're prepared to work with companies around that. I think that is the adjustment we all have to make. The world that we lived in, that we, you know, sort of cheap energy coming around. Singapore has to import every molecule of energy. We are looking at alternatives. We just came out with a new report called Energy 2050, you know, looking at hydrogen, looking potentially at nuclear. We just have to prepare for that. We're a low-lying island, and we just, and we will work with U.S. companies. So many of them are very deeply invested in Singapore, using Singapore for the region. And what they can do in Singapore in terms of that energy transition and decarbonization, they can then scale up in other places. So many of these ideas and innovations, we're prepared to work with them. Data centers are very energy intensive. Uh, then I think it is incumbent on the companies to see how they can do it in a way that uses less energy. Thank you. And I guess the short, short way to say my question is how can we help promote investment to bring down overall energy costs that in turn realizes investment all over the Indo-Pacific? But I mean, okay. you hit it well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thanks. Um, unless anyone else wants to take on the energy digital nexus. Um, any other questions? If not, I think we have reached the noon hour, but I don't want to deprive anybody who's got a burning question. Okay, I guess not. Um, all right, well. They're so used to typing their questions on the know, screen. I know, I know. That's true. It may be, it may that actually does, be. That's the change we're all getting it, used to. We're going to have to get used to all of this again. But, uh, but look, we're just <laughs> delighted to have had um, such a terrific uh, discussion with such great panelists. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking the three uh, guests for being here. And, and these are these are definitely conversations we're going to continue um, at CSIS, and I'm sure with our friends at U.S. ASEAN Business Council. So um, stay tuned for more. This is the end for today. Um, we are going to reconvene. Greg tells me at 8:30 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you're in the uh, the region, um, set your clocks or uh, figure out what time that is where you are. Um, and uh, 8:30 is, I think, when Greg will be reconvening uh, tomorrow morning. So. Thank you all for your participation today, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. We should talk sometime. Absolutely. I welcome a chance. Yeah. 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 Get in touch anytime. Yeah.